we as Muslims have an obligation to teach others about our religion. We're not obligated to convert people. We are not like other religions where we go knocking door to door to try to convert people to Islam. We do owe it to the legacy of the Prophet to teach and educate others about our religion, to at least at the minimal, to remove any misconceptions which people may have in the minds, um, in, in their minds based on the world that we live in. You know, obviously today in this contemporary era with social media, with 24 hour news networks, with people, Muslims, so-called Muslims acting in a way contrary to the religion, we see that many non-Muslims and even Muslims for, for that matter have taken a very bad impression of Islam. They have looked at it in a negative light. And so we owe it to the religion and we owe it obviously to ourselves and our future generation to be able to convey the true mission of Islam. In this hadith which I want to mention today that comes to us from the 8th Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa Radha, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. He talks about one aspect of written propagation about the Ahlul Bayt. And he says that there is not a single believer who recites a poem in the Ahlul Bayt's praise except that Allah builds for that person a city in paradise. And the city, he says, is more expansive, the expanse is more than this world seven times over. And in that city, all of the close angels of Allah and every appointed messenger will come to visit that individual. So this is just one example. There are numerous, numerous traditions that talk about the need for us to write, to speak, to propagate about the, uh, again, about Islam, about the Ahlul Bayt salam in specific. Here the 8th Imam has given us example about poetry. And that's why we always try to encourage the new generation to take up the pen, to write poetry about the Ahlul Bayt, to compose words of praise of Allah in English, or maybe in French, or maybe in Spanish, or whatever the, you know, the colloquial language of that center may be. But the point here being is to ensure that we uh, protect and preserve the legacy of Ahlul Bayt in a way that we and the new upcoming generations can benefit from. Obviously it's not limited to poetry. This is one example of the Imam. I want to just give a few other examples of you know, another way of propagation of the Ahlul Bayt's teachings alayhum salam And that is really in the area of English literature. Right? When we look at one of the mediums of how people take in knowledge, how we learn more about our religion, how we can convey it to other people, many times people won't come to a religious center. They won't come and want to sit through a lecture of 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. But we know because of the way that the world has transformed itself, that via technology we can easily convey, you know, teachings at the, at the push of a button. So whether that be social media, whether that be videos or audio, or whether it be even, you know, books and articles, these all become mediums through us being able to convey the teachings and, and give these to people who may not otherwise know about them. When we look at the English language, because obviously our language here is English, we see that we are lacking in a lot of areas in terms of literature about Islam and more specifically about the Islam as taught by the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. Just to give you a few examples. One is a commentary of the Quran. Right? We have this Quran which we have, mashallah, full shelf there full of Quran. And all of our homes, I'm sure, have at least one copy of the Qur'an printed. Maybe multiple, we all have the Qur'an on our smartphones, on our tablets, on our computers. We all can read the Qur'an probably to an extent, at least of pronunciation of the letters of the Arabic. Maybe we have a translation so we can understand what we're reading. But a question comes up is that, do we understand what we recite? For the most part, a majority of Muslims, whether you are Arabic born, Arabic speaking or not, I would like to say that a majority of Muslims don't understand the actual Quran. We're very good at memorization. We have competitions in our centers to memorize the Quran, to recite the Quran, to listen to it being recited. But if we ask, even for example, what is the translation of Surah Al-Fatiha? seven verses that we read at least a minimal of 10 times a day in our wajib prayers, 70 times a week. 
That's what, 210 times a month, thousands of times a year, many people may not be able to come and articulate a clear translation in English or in their native tongue of Surah Fatiha, which we recite so often every day in our lives. And then a question will come, well, if you've memorized it, if you know the translation, do you know the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha? What does the word, for example, Alhamdulillah mean? Why does Allah use Ar-Rahman and Rahim? Why these two traits? What do they mean? What is the root of them? What is the difference? Because they both come from the same root word. Rahman and Rahim are from the same source of Rahmaniya, the mercy of Allah. But do we know the difference between the two? We ask Allah, اِحْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ mustaqim, Keep us or guide us onto the straight path. Do we know from the Qur'an what that straight path is about? Do we know any ayat, indicators that could guide us to find that straight path that we keep asking Allah for? These and many other questions should come up because we recite this so often. And we're not commentators ourselves, but we should be able to tap into scholars who have written. But when we look in the English language today, we don't have, as a community of followers of Ahlul Bayt today, we don't have a single comprehensive commentary of the entire Qur'an in English. We have people who have done, for example, portions of the Qur'an, like Al-Mizan, Tafsir of Namuna, Baitul Nasi Maqar, Mishirazi, but we have literally thousands of commentaries in Arabic and Persian that we don't have in English. And so this is one area that is so lacking in our community, in, in our Shia society, that we don't even have a thorough commentary of the Qur'an in English that we can pick up and say, you know, I want to learn about Surah Hud, for example, or Surah Ibrahim, or Surah Yunus, and find a commentary of it. Because unfortunately, it doesn't exist in English. A comprehensive, which would cover many aspects of, the, of these and many other surahs. So one of the areas that we lack, that we have to think about, and we have to push forward if we really want to learn the Qur'an, is to have literature available in the field of Qur'an. Another area that I point to is our prime books of hadith. Now we know that we have thousands of volumes of books of hadith. We have multiple scholars through the last 14 centuries who have written, compiled, put together books of hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, the sayings of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. We have books like Al-Kafi, like Al-Istibsar, like Man La Yahdurul Faqih, like At-Tahdib, like Biharul Anwar, like Wasa'ul Shia. These and hundreds of other books are there in Arabic. Some of them have partial translations, if not full, into Farsi, into Urdu, into other languages. But we haven't got a full translation, except for Al-Kafi, and that too is very difficult to get our hands on in English, we don't have a comprehensive translation of all of our hadith. We don't necessarily need to go to the hadith. Us as laymen will never go to a hadith and base our rulings on a hadith that we read because we don't operate in that function because there's an entire process of deducing the hadith, looking at the authenticity, looking at the context of the hadith, we don't have that ability. But just the ability to be able to read the, the statements of the Prophet and Imams, to see what they talked about, to see how they lived their lives, how they interacted with people. right? Just to see the words and read the words of the Imams when they entered into theological debates with non-Muslims. To see how the Prophet lived his life, what was the sunnah of the Prophet? How did he live a day-to-day -day life? We don't have a lot of that. We have certain hadith, we don't have comprehensive books, but we have scholars who have taken um, samplings of hadith, like for example, we have the book Mishkatul Anwar, like the book, um, and that's also in English, like the book Mizanul Hikmah, a summary of Mizanul Hikmah, because the original is about 12 volumes. We have a summary in English and a few other books, a bundle of flowers which is available in English, and a few other books like this, the Kitab of Sulaim ibn Qais, who was a companion of the first five Imams, and he wrote a book which is also available in English. So we have certain books that are available, but the vast majority of our hadith are not yet in English. So again, another area that's lacking, that we have not yet put effort, time, money, resources into getting people to translate these and, and make them available in English. 
And third, which is just a general topic, is books on many other topics. Right? There are a lot of areas that people ask questions about. A lot of areas in Islam that we don't have you know, enough literature on. I mean, history books, definitely, we have hundreds of books on history. We have many books on the life of the Prophet, of the Imams. We have many books in, let's say, in the field of politics. We have some books in Islamic ethics and morality and akhlaq. We have a lot of books on fiqh, on ahkam, how to pray, how to go for hajj, all of these basic actions. But there's still a lot lacking that we don't have in English. And obviously those areas need to be identified. We need to either write original works for our audience in North America, or find books that are available to translate, to modify, to fit with our contemporary climate. But the point being here is that written propagation of the Ahlul Bayt is an obligation that we have. If we don't have the ability to do the work ourselves, to write, to research, to translate, then we have to do our best to support those who are doing it financially, emotionally, give them whatever support they need. Because ultimately it will benefit us by us getting a reward for doing this work. <laughs>